Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, everybody. And we spoil movies tonight on the show. Kelly Reichardt's spiritual Yelp review of Portland, Oregon. It's her 2008 film, Wendy and Lucy. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. Uh, and we've got a blot spot to kick us off. Friend of the show, Ben Lott, with his rebound on last week's Denzelathon. The Book of Eli. I had the ending spoiled for me, and yet Book of Eli still worked great. I bought into the world they created and the entire premise. Yes, it was hard to buy into that final reveal, but aside from that aspect, most of the movie was so much fun, I didn't care. The action sequences were superb, and Denzel and Gary Oldman were amazing as usual. Your rank 221, my rank 47. Were we too hard on it? Well, I know that it had some uh, some uh, rock, paper, scissor losses. <laughs> <laughs> that, who's, uh, that wait a minute, probably, wait a minute. I, I got to remember. Um, I, yes, whose fault was that? That would be me. That would be me. Yeah, but you, you know, know what? good. It was your fault. Yes, I, it was your fault. But from, from my perspective, <laughs> I think that it's fine. <laughs> you might feel otherwise. I, I think 
capital W we were too hard on it, and it was your fault. And there you go. And you know, Ben gave me some trouble uh, uh, offline about that. It, you know, he was sort of poking at this idea that maybe I'm being a little bit persnickety uh, uh, about this particular point, and I, I seed that. It, it's possible I'm overthinking it, but you know, it is what it is. It's one of those movies you you have to buy into all these different elements in order for it to fully work. And so uh, that's that, that's an element I bought into more readily, but the other ones uh, not quite as much. So well, that's really the thing. And you know, he was he and I think you are looking at it more from a, a glass half full perspective, and I'm glass half emptying it. Like it's a movie that works so well in all these other areas that those little things are you know even more disappointing. And I think um, so. So it's it's. I notice them more. It's harder for me to get get behind it. But still, love the look of the film. It deserves much more than what is it? I think a fifty one percent or something on Rotten Tomatoes. So uh, I, I think it deserves more than that. Anyway, uh, Nick Langdon, a friend of the show and deeply thoughtful critic himself and uh, a gentleman and a scholar and uh, he's a good looking and intelligent <laughs> person. Uh, he wrote in a fantastic. Uh, email on our Guilty Pleasure series from 2014, in which, let me think, Andy, what was the highlight of that email? Um, <laughs> drumming my fingers on the desk. What oh, did the handsome man. Nick Langdon say about my pick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nick said he just got a fresh take from 2014 as he wanted to tell us how much he enjoyed our Guilty Pleasure series. He'd heard of both of the films that we had talked about. Your Guilty Pleasure was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, and my Guilty Pleasure was Knowing. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, he finally had the impetus to sit down and watch both of these films. And yes, you're right. He did enjoy yours quite a bit. <laughs> Let's. I, I, I just need to, uh, I, I need to read a, a particular point, though, because I don't think you're punching it hard enough. Uh, he says, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I can't wait to see it again. I'm spreading the word as others must witness this. And here, here it is. I'm bolding and italicizing this. I'm officially on board for Buckaroo Banzai cult. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Not quite so much the knowing cult. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it's just me. It's just me over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, well. in, in that regard, uh, you, you definitely won the guilty part. So I'll give you that. Yeah. Well, you, you won the following <laughs> one. So uh, I'll, I'll let you just kind of stew on that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I'll take it. But I will say that, uh, that Nick did bring also uh, something else up that uh, he thought perhaps we should go back and revisit our Catherine Bigelow series. He had seen a 35 millimeter showing of Near Dark and uh, celebrating the career of Bill Paxton after he passed away. And uh, you know, it's a great idea. It certainly would be a fun uh, series to revisit. So uh, we'll keep that in the back of our minds as we continue planning. Nick, thanks for writing in. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> Red Band Rule. <laughs> oh God, is that is that what we're doing now? You're just gonna drop it every week. I I I'm not even intentionally finding Red Band trailers, but <laughs> it's like the trailer that I liked. It happened to be Red Band. It's not my fault. Yeah, it's not my right. fault. I like the naughty trailers. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, so my trailer, Pete. Uh, it's actually a little bit of a teaser. It's kind of a half trailer. Um, uh, but it's for the film. Uh, Ingrid goes west in which Aubrey Plaza, uh, who we've talked about, uh, actually, I think you had her as a, in your trailer pick. Um, gosh, when was that? Just a, It seems like it was just a few months ago, but uh, maybe a little longer. Uh, what was that? Mike and, uh, Mike and so-and-so need wedding yeah, dates? Yeah, Mike and Dave need Mike, wedding yeah, dates. Exactly. And, you know, she, she looked fantastic in that film. This film, uh, it, it has a little bit of a sense of the same sort of character, but definitely somebody who's a little more mentally disturbed. And, uh, you know, the, it starts off with her really bitter looking at images of a friend's wedding as she as her friend is like tweeting and and uh, posting pictures live. And she's bitter and angry that she wasn't invited. So she turns up looking just completely haggard and <laughs> a complete mess. And she's <laughs> says some rather vulgar things to her, quote, friend who didn't invite her and sprays her with pepper spray. <laughs> 
It's just terrible. And and then the trailer just kind of goes from there. It's a really interesting uh, glimpse into this woman's life. And, I mean, it, it is a teaser. You don't get a full sense of the trailer or, or what the story's going to be. Um, the story, according to the synopsis on IMDb, which are always thorough, says Ingrid Thorburn, a mentally disturbed young woman, becomes obsessed with Taylor Sloan, played by Elizabeth Olsen, a social media star who appears to have the perfect life. But when Ingrid decides to drop everything and move west to befriend Taylor, her behavior turns unsettling and increasingly dangerous. You definitely get that sense from the trailer. It is billed as a comedy drama, though, so there's, there is a lot of funny in the trailer. And uh, I've kind of latched onto that, and it, it gets me pretty excited. Plus, O'Shea Jackson Jr. pops up as somebody she's, she's hanging out with, and uh, it's great seeing him again after uh, relatively recently in, uh, in Straight Outta Compton. So uh, this looked really exciting to me. Uh, what do you think of it? I don't know what the hell this is about. <laughs> like, I watched that trailer, and I was befuddled. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, yes i don't I, it's great <laughs> it, it, it was it's bananas it comes completely off the rails from the very beginning of of the trailer uh i don't know uh, I, I don't know anybody who m- made it right uh david branson smith and um uh, was it matt spicer matt spicer uh, director uh i i don't know the work of those guys uh they seem to have the corner on uh the the sort of uh, single white female next gen thing. Uh, it, maybe maybe that's that's what this is all about. I thought it looked crazy. I totally see why you connect with it. Uh, I did not have that <laughs> same kind of connection, uh, but I'm I'm willing to be open minded because I actually thought uh, the wedding dates was <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, and maybe that'll be my guilty pleasure. <laughs> right, there you go. Yeah, no, it, it looks interesting. Matt Spicer, I mean, he hasn't really done much, just uh, kind of a, some some short films and uh, and uh, not much else. I mean, it, it really kind of seems like a little bit of a breakout film for him. And then um, David Branson Smith has uh, has been, in, you know, involved in like the TV show Enlightened with Laura Dern and stuff. So yeah, it's it, it's an interesting pair, and I look forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, it did play at Sundance, and it's going to have a release August fourth. My trailer, Andy, is Black Butterfly from director Brian Goodman, writers Mark Friedman and Justin Stanley. It is the remake of the French thriller that I have also not seen, Papillon Noir. Uh, have you seen that one? I have not. I have not. It is. It's sort of a misery story, right? So it's I, I, any movie that includes. Uh, I'm a writer. I get kind of excited about. Like I, I like these movies about writers and the story and <laughs> struggles they go through. This one uh, takes the misery story and also throws it completely off the rails really fast. It definitely issues subtlety for action, and uh, you know I'm I'm questioned that. It stars, however, Antonio Banderas and Jonathan Rice Myers, who I like very much, both of these gentlemen. And so I think that uh, uh, it has promise on that front alone. Uh, anytime Antonio Banderas gets beaten up a lot and then uh, goes on a vengeful uh, streak, uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, he sort of cornered the market on that character arc. Uh, for me in my head and if <laughs> even if he is carrying a typewriter instead of a guitar case uh, I'm okay I'm okay with that uh, so uh, I also don't know a whole lot from uh, Brian Goodman uh, Brian is an actor mostly he's only directed uh, two things this one uh, and what doesn't kill you uh, which uh, actually I've heard great things about it but I haven't seen it started Ethan Hawk it was one of our uh, you know, the many films of Ethan Hawke in a row uh, and Mark Ruffalo. I don't know. Did you ever see that one? I didn't. No, it, it looks kind of interesting. But yeah, uh, you're looked, right. It definitely I mean, looked interesting. Brian Goodman has been quite the busy boy, though. He has been very busy. Uh, so it looks like he's getting more into the director's chair, Mark Friedman. Uh, he's a producer of some note. He's produced a bunch of films, uh, but uh, and acted in one, written uh, just this black butterfly. So uh, I I think it's uh, I think it looks really interesting. You, you know I I hope it offers a little bit more uh, nuance than the trailer uh, portrays. What do you think? Yeah, I mean there there really isn't much nuance, and there's really no surprise. The trailer kind of gives everything away. It's uh, there's no surprise that uh, Jonathan Rhys Meyers' character ends up uh, kind of the crazy guy, um, and so. Uh, you know, it, it does make me curious kind of exactly what the what the thrill of the story is going to be. Is it just the psychological 
dance between these two guys? Is it going to uh, it involve? Uh, I mean, obviously, there's there's Piper Perabo's character and and how she gets involved. There's potentially missing women. So I'm curious what those other elements are and kind of if it builds itself psychologically, and that's where we end up kind of as as these two characters kind of go through their thing. Um, uh, I saw a similar film last year called Hush about the the deaf woman and the guy who comes and kind of uh, uh, stalks and attacks her in her house in the middle of nowhere, and right. um. Uh, that one ended up uh, interestingly. It was all she was also a writer, um, and interesting the way that some of that ended up playing out. And um, so it, this makes me really curious about this one. I think you're right. The trailer gives maybe a little too much away, kind of paints it a little too straightforward. So I'm curious where it's going to go, but I am interested in it. I I think it's worth seeing. I it, you know at, at least to see how it handles itself. I wish I had uh, more specific release dates. Right now it just says 2017. Uh, so that's that's maybe telling. Yeah, there you go. In itself. Okay, well, they couldn't pin it on me, man. I was gone. Great dog, what's her name? Uh, Lucy. Your sweetheart, Lucy. Where are you going? Going to Alaska. Woohoo! King Salmon! You going to work? Can't sleep here, ma'am. You can't sleep out here, it's not allowed. Okay. Fifty dollars. You can pay your fine now, or you can come back for a trial with a judge. I don't. I don't. I don't live here. I'm, I'm just passing through. If you get stopped in another state, you're just going to end up right back here. Wendy and Lucy from director Kelly Reichardt. I, I say director, but that's being unnecessarily uh, uh, stingy with her role. She seems to do just about everything on the film, uh, uh, written by. Uh, John Raymond, who uh, actually, it, it's a very strange, well, not very strange, but it's a co-writing thing. Uh, John wrote the, the short story uh, in parallel with Kelly Reichardt, who wrote the screenplay. They are frequent collaborators. Uh, stars Michelle Williams and Lucy the Dog and Dave Koppel and Will Patton, briefly. Uh, it is a, it's a subdued film. Is that fair? <laughs> sure. It's definitely minimal. So, did you say that they wrote it in parallel? They did. I I, I actually watched an interview with Kelly Reichardt who talked about it, and and in fact, in in a number of of places, she says that the script was ahead of writing the short story, uh, and so they they wrote it together and kind of were exploring these ideas together. It was a, a very much a co idea, uh, and so I, I thought that was a really interesting way to to present the thing uh, that this went on together. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, they had previously collaborated on uh, her previous film, Old Joy, which also was based on a short story of his. So I'm wondering if they did the same thing with that one. Um, I don't know. Or they did this one at the same time he was writing more of his books before they were published. I'm curious about that now. Because then he goes on to write uh, Meek's Cutoff and Night Moves, but I don't believe she was involved in the writing at all in either of those. So uh, we'll just kind of continue to explore you know, their writing relationship and uh, filmmaking relationship as as we continue this series. But it's uh, it's definitely interesting, and uh, you know, it just speaks to the nature of collaboration, I guess, right? Yeah, t- uh, totally. And I, I've never heard uh, I, I've never heard of a collaboration happening quite that way. So I, I found it really fascinating that um, uh, that that they were exploring a narrative uh, in different sort of uh, formats. Uh, at the same time, and kind of allowing the world to unfold. When you talk about world building, you know what what influences what. Well, to to actually uh, give you another example, which I think is pretty interesting, um, Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke kind of collaborated at the same time on two thousand one. Oh, yes. Well, I guess there you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they developed it concurrently, and the book actually ended up getting published after the film was released. In that particular case, so uh, yeah, Passing. kind of an interesting little uh, uh, note. So they're in good company, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a really this is an interesting film. IMDb. I have to read this because I think it's a really funny synopsis for the story, which almost has more information in it than the movie does. Um, I was thinking about this when you were reading the other terrible IMDb synopsis right. for your trailer tonight. Goodness, uh, is, IMDb. I know. Over the summer. A series of unfortunate happenings trigger a financial crisis for a young woman, and she soon finds her life falling apart. 
I mean, I guess I shouldn't say it has more information, but I mean, I don't recall it ever saying it's summer. You know, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's weirdly written and it doesn't focus on really kind of anything that the well, story is yeah. specifically focusing on. So it doesn't look like summer. People, I know Portland summer. It is brief <laughs> and you notice it. AFI, this movie did win movie of the year um, for AFI. And this is what they wrote. And I thought it was kind of a good way to kind of start us off because this is a very different type of film than we have talked about uh, in this year, really, and, and for most of our uh, show. This is a very minimal type of story. And this is what AFI said. Wendy and Lucy is a precisely observed portrait of life on the edge in America where every dollar is measured and daily decisions are high drama. Director, co-writer, and co-editor, Kelly Reichert trusts the simplicity of a well-plotted emotional story to reach its audience, infusing this minimalist movie about a woman and her dog with quiet moments that do not beg for sympathy. Michelle Williams' heroic performance is the center of this powerful poem about friendship, what it is to care, to give, and to let go, as the wail of a distant train calls for a better life. That's better. That That's better. Yeah, better than IMDb. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I think it is worth talking about uh, this nature of storytelling in all the different sizes that uh, that it comes in, right? I mean, uh, like I said, we haven't talked about very many minimalist or very small sorts of character films like this. This is a very uh, different type of film. I mean, uh, you know, we, just looking at this year, we've had the Hughes brothers. Uh, we've had Zhang Yimou. Um, Eddie Murphy, just there's a lot of stuff going on in those movies. This is not one of those. I mean, Kelly is kind of considered this minimalist uh, director. And um, I mean, you know, I, there are all sorts of different kinds of stories out there. And uh, and I guess the question I have for you to kick this off is, um, I mean, yes, there are different types of books. You have, you know, a wide variety. Movies generally come in you know, close to two hour packages. Does it end up feeling different when you watch a movie that that it's this type of a story? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, this was, I couldn't help think about this, that this was the kind of film that I would love to have made more so than I enjoyed watching it. Right. I mean, it is I, I love the cinematography. I love, you know, friend of the show. Uh, Sam Levy is is the man behind the camera on this. Uh, it is uh, delightfully minimal in visual tone. I love that so much of the film just hangs so precariously on the performance of this single actress. And I think she does a fantastic job delivering it. I could not help but think, and I watched this with my daughter, uh, and, you know, it's a dog story. I thought we certainly we would connect with this, but I couldn't help but think that this was a film that uh, needed to be shorter, that this would have made a beautiful, bite-sized bit of a short. It could have told the whole story more briefly, less meanderingly, uh, less um, uh, long-windedly. I guess, visually. And I don't mean that as kind of a diminutive. I know it sounds that way because I really appreciate this film, but it, it it's not one I feel like I'm going to, to, you know, go back and reflect on that often uh, now that I've seen it. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually liked it. I, I, I liked, uh, well, and I know you're saying you liked it too, but I, I liked the length of it. I didn't have any issues with that. I feel like I, I might have been a little uh, more disappointed if I had actually seen this in a the theater <laughs> where I would have paid, <laughs> paid more money to see it. I, this to oh, me, that says it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a cinematic film, right? This, this no. to me felt very um, um, intimate and it felt very much like the sort of film that you would watch on a, on a screen at home. I mean, it wasn't shot cinematically. It's certainly not something that, that warrants the, the big IMAX sort of screen or 3D or anything like that. I mean, it's a very small, intimate story, very simply shot, not anything uh, complex. I mean, there's definitely some thought put into the way that the camera is moving and the way that the story is told. Um, but it certainly is, is just a very simple sort of story. It's it's a very f narrow focus on this moment in this character's life. I loved uh, just everything that Michelle Williams was doing here. It was beautiful. It was touching. It was haunting. It was painful. 
And uh, I, I, but, but yes, I, I agree with you. It's not, uh, it's not a, it's, it's such a small story that it's like not something I, I feel like I would ever have to revisit. I feel like I've kind of pinpointed exactly what it was. And, and now I feel, okay, great. I, I have that in my head now and I can move on past it. Well, here's the thing for you, though. When you look at this film, it's, it is it is a small story. It's about her and her, uh, you know, her relationship with kind of the road. Uh, it is a road story, you know, girl goes west story, uh, insofar as it's it's a place on that road journey where all the action stops, right? She breaks down in Portland. Uh, but um, it, it is also a story about poverty. It, it is a story about a class of poverty that isn't rooted in sort of stereotypes of, um, you know, or direct homelessness. It's it's a class of poverty where you are like the next $50 from homelessness. You have enough money to get gas in the tank to go to the next job kind of poverty. It, it is a it is a class of poverty that uh, is is much larger, I think, even than uh, the the abject, you know, on the street poverty that we that we see often reflected in film uh, it is it is a look at and I think Michelle Williams plays this beautifully this sort of terrifying kind of introspection that comes when you know you're losing the last thread of of what of the things that you have and when you have lost that and this powerful relationship in your life which is your dog uh, you know what happens next and and I think that's a that's a, a really interesting, um, kind of perspective that this film presents. I wonder, is this an activist film in that regard? Well, it certainly is something that Kelly has uh, ke- has kind of brought to the fold in some of her other stories. It cer- certainly seems to be something that she has uh, she she likes that sort of story, um, and I think maybe a little bit, but I don't think it's. You know, when you have it so intimate and so narrowly focused on just this particular character, um, it's hard for me to get behind saying it's an activist film, even though I can totally see how you could say that. You know, I think it's fair to say that. I just don't know if it's out and out coming uh, coming out and saying that. But I mean, you know, I mean, look at the the scene you have with the uh, uh, with the store clerk, Andy who, uh, you know, is judging her for trying to steal the the dog food. And, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, you shouldn't even have a dog. And the stuff that he's saying to her um, is kind of, you know, hateful stuff just because of what's happened. I mean, granted, she was trying to steal the stuff. But uh, it's, it's a, uh, it is kind of a mentality. And so when you say, you know, could it be seen as an activist film? There are elements in there that have that. It's just not coming out and out, and it's not uh, like uh, Al Gore is behind it, where you know exactly, you know, it's 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 on the sleeve, right? Yeah, I'm. Mean, it's. I don't know. I, I. I. Some of the feedback that I've been reading is is around, you know, how well this film, you know, for all of those who who don't appreciate it, uh, how well this film actually captures the experience. Of being in this class of poverty, and so uh, you know, I wonder if if uh, I I don't know I, I wonder what it would take to move it into that um, that next sort of uh, rank of activist filmmaking for you uh, that that makes it so more of even a more of an obvious choice because insofar as I don't have the direct experience of of you know um, Wendy's in this case um, I've been pretty close and it's it's hard. Uh, and um, and and it hurts, and it hurts to reflect on kind of the rules of society, as you say. The 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 scene with the clerk that the clerk was so young too that the clerk yeah. was uh, so out of touch with somebody who is in his own peer group um, generationally. I, I found you know a, a really stunning indictment of the gap, sort of the cultural gap. Um, of of that that this sort of poverty represents. Well, and I think that's an interesting element and and talking about it as an activist film again. I think I think what this film doesn't do that an activist film might do is 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 you know get a get the viewer to a point where after it's over you're actively going to do something about it, right? I mean that I guess that's kind of the sense of what an activist film is going to do. It's designed to get you to now take a stand and, and fight for it. This 
I think is a good way to kind of open the door into this world so people can better understand it. It's more of a take a walk in their shoes sort of story rather than an activist film. I guess that's kind of how I would classify it a little better. So far, the film has has activated you to not watch the film again. <laughs> well, that's what you're no, telling me. No, 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 no. But <laughs> it's it's. But I I walked in her. You're shoes. starting a real movement. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> No, no, no. But I mean, it's 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 a film that uh, I think you walk in her shoes. You really this gives me such a good sense of being in her shoes and just all the things going on in her life. Opening up the trunk to or the the hood to her car and looking at the engine, knowing something's wrong. But you have that fantastic still shot of just the the whole you know body of everything under the hood. <laughs> There's no movement, and you just like she looks at it. And she just shuts it. It's like, I doesn't even know what to do. That was brilliant. That's, that's like brilliant. exactly what I would do. <laughs> exactly. I would look, I would definitely go through the motions of opening the hood. And I would probably think in the back of my mind, maybe I'll figure it out. Right. Even maybe though there's no chance I would figure it out. So, yeah, those moments, I, I mean, they're, they're, this movie is full of these wonderful moments that, that her character, Wendy, goes through. I mean, the, the frightening moment of, of uh, being confronted by the, uh, the person in the, in the forest in the middle of the night. Um, right from the beginning, you have her kind of meeting this group of, of uh, kind of young hippies sitting around a campfire and talking and, and smoking weed. And all of a sudden, she can't find her dog. And then, uh, you know, that's how she comes across this group. Her dog is with these people. And yeah. and she kind of has to kind of lure her dog back. And a lot of really interesting moments in just kind of this, not just the, the life of poverty, but also just this life of a, a single woman on the road by herself with only her dog as her companion. And it certainly painted a lot of uh, fear that, you know, you kind of experience in just how she has to live and, and protect herself and just kind of pay attention to her surroundings. So I, I think that Kelly captures all of that incredibly, incredibly well. I, did, did I tell you the, the, the one sequence that I made a note of was when the cop says, you know, the security guard says, you can't park your car in the parking lot, right? That's that's not a thing you can do. You got to move it to the street. And then the car right. won't start. She's sleeping in the car overnight. And there's that knock on the on the window. And that's a terrifying sound, uh, you know, when, when you're sleeping in your car. And I did I tell you the story about the big drive when I was sleeping in the car, uh, you know, a few years back? I, uh, I'm sure you did, did. Did I tell you this? I, I know you stopped was, here. <laughs> it was, well, this wasn't even where you are. This was in Petaluma, California. I have to tell you the story. I, I was in Petaluma and I'd been driving all night and I stopped. I pulled over and I was in, in right outside a public park on a public street. And uh, the bathroom kind of vestibule was over there. And I kind of went in and brushed my teeth and I came back and I, I got a few hours of sleep. And there comes the knock on the door. And it's terrifying, a knock on the window. And it's a police officer. And I opened that. First of all, I had locked the door. And, I, you know, I'm, I have none of the the sort of the the gender the midnight gender fear, right? I I as a I understand that there is some privilege uh, that I am a you know middle aged white man in a Hyundai Sonata, right? I get that, <laughs> and and I still felt that shock of oh my god, it's the middle of the night and a cop is there with a flashlight in my eyes, and I I first set off the alarm on my car, which is embarrassing at three in the morning, and then. Uh, I once I get out of the car, he says, "You gotta, you gotta go someplace else because the the neighbors are are nervous about somebody sleeping in their car in their neighborhood." I said, "Really? Like this is a suburban neighborhood? I could park my car here. I just can't be in it and asleep at the same time. Could I sit in my car awake? Yeah, that would be fine." Then he says, <laughs> "You know where? You know where we don't patrol at all?" I said, "Where?" He says, "You go down about a mile. You turn left. You turn right. Right by the highway. There's a Taco Bell parking lot. We never patrol there." And I'm thinking, really, man, we're gonna we're gonna wear our racism so blatantly on our <laughs> sleeves. We don't even send cops to the Mexican fast food restaurant anymore. Oh, it's just <laughs> awful. So you know, <laughs> I know I'm going on about that. I couldn't I couldn't help but think about that experience when I'm watching this movie. Like that is, I have a, a safe home to to come home to, and I I was doing this as kind of an inter, inter, introspective journey. Uh, she's doing this out of great necessity, and I feel like I only got an an inch, uh, you know, on, on the way to understanding the the feeling that you get when 
uh, you know, when, when your, <laughs> you know, your safe space is taken away. And, and, uh, so she wasn't looking for the Taco Bell parking lot. That's the thing. <laughs> she, totally wrong parking lot, Wendy. Come on. <laughs> You've come from Indiana <laughs> all the way so to here. Stupid. You should have figured it yeah. out by now. What a judger yeah, you that's are. That's right. What a judger. <laughs> right? <laughs> judger. Oh anyway. man. Well, Kelly, this is her uh this is her second feature film, I believe. Her first one was in 1994 called River of Grass, which I guess I actually was just reading about it. It had a um uh whatever company had released it, they um actually did a Kickstarter campaign to digitally restore the movie and I guess it was supposed to screen at this past Sundance, which I, I didn't hear if it did or not. And then it was going to have a limited theatrical re-release last year. I meant Sundance last year, 2016. And uh, so theoretically, it should be available sometime soon. But I don't know exactly what's going on with that. But uh, yeah, River of Grass was her debut. And then she did a few short films. Then Old Joy in 2006, which very critically acclaimed film. And then uh, 2008, Wendy and Lucy. And that's so we're coming in on her third feature film. Um, and you know, she said, let me, let me read this thing that, uh, that I found on the uh, story about, uh, river of grass that kind of talks about these sorts of films. Uh, she has described the film as a road movie without the road, a love story without the love and a crime story without the crime. This is river of grass. She's talking about her subsequent films, such as Wendy and Lucy and Meek's cutoff involve similar themes of people trying to leave a place, but frustrated by their lack of resources of that theme. Reichert said, I guess it's just a good setup for different kinds of searching question asking, looking for the next place to go. What are you looking for? What are you leaving? All those things are good for grounding it in getting from point A to point B. I thought that was kind of an interesting, like, this is why she likes these types of stories. I haven't seen Old Joy. In fact, this is the first Kelly Reichert film I've seen. Um, But I'm guessing this is kind of something that we should look forward to in kind of the rest of the films we're going to be talking about is this kind of, you know, people searching internally sorts of stories. I, I don't know. I I feel like I'm I'm a little bit ill-equipped to talk about her as a as a director, only because I haven't seen the other two films we're going to be talking about, and so I I don't really feel like I have much of a pattern to base it off of. Uh, what's your uh, What's your sense of of her ability to to kind of put that that big high level mission of asking questions on screen? Well, I think that when you're directing a story like this, it definitely um, revolves around the actors and the performances that you're going to be getting out of it. I mean, you're, yes, there is some interesting, I, should, I don't know if I'd say interesting, but there is some some camera work that is specifically designed to uh, be a part of the story um, and kind of help tell that story. Um, but I think the vast majority of what we're looking at here are the performances and just kind of the the relationships between these characters that we're meeting on screen. And in particular, the one that I think is the strongest, of course, is uh, Wendy and the security guard, uh, which I think is a really interesting relationship. And I enjoy seeing how that ends up evolving over time. And it really uh, just kind of hit me hard when the security guard um, gives her some cash that he has in his pocket um, and kind of does it in a way that he doesn't want his, his daughter to see. Um, but, um, when you, when she looks at how much it is, it's only like seven bucks or something like that. And that was just, that was like, oh man, that was just like, he's giving her probably, you know, that's probably all of the money he has right now. Uh, because I mean, he's also, I mean, it's not like he's living in any high life or anything. And it's just like, wow, that was a really powerful moment for me. It totally subverts what is otherwise a pretty stereotypical moment, too, you know? And, and that, I think, is as much a celebration of what, uh, what she does in this story around money, around, you know, the, the constant recalculation of the budget. Um, you know, I, I go back to my own journals and I see the, you know, of years back, you know, even in college of looking at the, um, you know, dollar, dollars by day, you know, what can I, how much can I spend to eat? Uh, you know, right now, and and I I thought that was a a beautiful element in the film. But what you normally would expect, and what I admit I even expected, was here is this savior. He is coming into this parking lot, and he is going to take care of her problems. She'll be able to pay off her car. She'll be able to get back on the road and get gas. She'll go get her dog, and and realize that she's she's okay in the world. And in fact, it just gets darker. And the the celebration of that choice of of hers 
to only make the value of that gift seven bucks, uh, it comes with that, that sort of bittersweet realization that this movie is not going anywhere happy. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting look into, like you said, it's just the struggle of this type of life. And it's and I think that sets up exactly what we're going to end up having at the climax of the film when she finally finds Lucy and that heartbreaking moment when she has that realization, I'm not going to be able to, uh, you know, bring you with me anymore. I, I'm struggling here and I just can't make it on my own. And that's really hard. It's a really hard moment. And... Um, and yeah, that's exactly where the story's going. But in order for her to keep going on her journey, it, that's where it has to go. Uh, I wonder at what point, as a character, she came to terms with the fact that she wasn't going to be able to to move on with Lucy. Uh, my my sense is it was earlier than you know her arrival at the fence where the thirty meets the leaving Erickson. Um, I, you know, I, I I sort of felt like. She made the she she came to the realization that in fact uh, you know her life is is not suited to have to be able to support this kind of a partner uh, much earlier in her journey to find Lucy and and for me that means the story is much more about her trying to say goodbye uh, and than trying to rescue the dog. I think that uh, yeah I I completely agree with everything you just said. I it would have been interesting to see how it would have played out if she found Lucy and Lucy was not at a good home, you know, where she's like, "Oh, now I'm going to have to rescue Lucy." Yeah. And where is that going to put me? You know, that would have been a much a different and potentially darker film. But um you know, it's it's really touching when she sees that guy kind of leaving the house and and she goes and talks to Lucy and it's just like, you know, he seems like a really nice guy and ugh. It really was. Yeah. Uh, it really was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's tough. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk uh, first shot, last shot. Yeah, for the first shot of the film, we have uh, a nice long shot of the train yard. A lot of natural uh, kind of sound montage of trains going by, uh, some commercial trains, uh, no passenger trains, um, and then uh, a little bit after that, we get to our first character shot, which is a tracking shot of Wendy and Lucy playing fetch with a stick parallel to the woods, almost as if the camera is on the train, looking at them, kind of uh, tracking them as they walk by. And the last shot, uh, Wendy is on the train alone, and we cut to, again, this tracking shot POV looking at the woods uh, as we uh, hard cut to the ed- to the credits. Uh, so I, I actually love that parallel you just indicated. I, I didn't make the connection, <laughs> weirdly, that the tracking shot was effectively on the train in the beginning, and it's on the train at the end. Yeah, I, I, I think it is really touching. And obviously, the trains, I mean, the story that this was... Uh, that this ended up becoming um, for John uh, was called Train Choir, and uh, trains kind of play a, a point in the story. And uh, like AFI talked about in their little write-up, as the wail of a distant train calls for a better life, this is kind of this journey that that uh, uh, Wendy is on. She's trying to get to Alaska so that she can go work at a cannery and hopefully, you know, uh, make it there. And, and start kind of finding her better life. Um, we, we start in the train yard. They didn't arrive here by train. They arrived by car. But we get this, uh, this sense that it's, it's a story about journeys and all these trains are going somewhere. And then in the end, the fact that she's actually on the trains now leaving this place. I think it has a nice thematic tie there. I, I like the beginning and end of this film. Um, she she calls it, um, uh, Reichert calls it, uh, uh, you know, calls Portland a train town. And I guess it is. Doesn't come to my house, so that's. Are there a lot of passenger trains and commercial trains, or is it just kind of a commercial train town? No, it's it's like any other city. I mean, it, there's a there's a major downtown train depot that that moves up and down the west coast and and sort of acts as a pretty major stop. Um, but it, it, it there is something to be said for this that uh, you know that Reichert says that you know pretty much it's it's tough to go anywhere without hearing a train. Whether it's a commuter train or a, you know the downtown train, there's a, a, a you know a, a fun uh, kind of inner circle train that gets you anywhere you want to go um, in the Portland's downtown area, and so it, it's a it, I guess it is a train town. I'm not much of a train person, but she has a good point. It, it's tough to go someplace. It's tough to you know go to a downtown hotel and you know open your window, go to sleep at night without hearing the train go by. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it it makes for kind of a fascinating 
um, thing. We'll talk about the sound a, a little bit, but w- one of the things that I, I like so much in this first shot is just the Nat sound uh, montage, right? It's the it's the sound of trains, and she said that anywhere she would otherwise have been inclined to use score, she used the sounds of trains as hmm. as kind of the the alternate music, and I thought that was a, a, a really um, sort of touching intention uh, about how to use trains and and how trains represent such a such movement right in and out of these places and ultimately Wendy gets stuck because she's stuck with her car which is otherwise this such a symbol of freedom but the trains are always right here and it takes her so long through the course of the film to realize hey I, I guess I can get out of here anytime I want I just have to hop on the train, the ultimate egress. And I, I thought that was really great. That is really nice. Casting by Ali Farrell and uh, Laura Rosenthal with Simon Max Hill in Portland and William Bailey for additional casting. Uh, kind of a short job for these lovely people. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's it's one of those casting jobs where, I mean, obviously there's Michelle Williams coming on board to play Wendy. Um, Lucy was an easy one since that was uh, uh, Kelly Reichert's own dog, Lucy, um, who also was in Old Joy. Um, and Will the dog Patton, was excellent, by the way. I, I know, fantastic excellent. work. And Will Patton was great stunt casting getting him in. He was probably on set for a day, maybe two days tops. Um, everybody else, I mean, it's it's an interesting cast of people, but, um, but not big faces. Um, I think they were all cast to be just kind of authentic people in their particular place. And for that, I mean, you know, I think casting... Um, it can be a little trickier just looking for authentic people rather than uh, movie star look sort of people. But I mean, you know, they did a great job here. I, I, I enjoyed the cast for feeling as authentic as it did. Oh, I did too. And, and you know, Michelle Williams sometimes surprises me, if only because, uh, you know, I'm actually I've explored watching Dawson's Creek with my daughter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're at that point. Oh, that's a tough one. That is such a tough one. I can't wait till you get there. Uh, it's it's tough, but uh, she this was not a, a, a Dawson's Creek performance. You know, she is she is a, a really talented and introspective and thoughtful actor, and I I thought she did just a terrific job here. Uh, I think it's fascinating that um, uh, we ended up doing you know um, the Reichart Michelle Williams films, right? I mean, yeah. this is these are the three films they did. Exactly. Yeah. I it kind of accidentally we ended up picking the three that uh, that Michelle stars in uh, directed by yeah. Kelly. So uh, it'll be interesting. I guess in that sense, it'll be nice to explore these three films and how their relationship ends up kind of um, developing over the course of the three films uh, with Michelle's right. performance and Kelly's directing. Right. So. Uh, there's one funny story with Will Patton. Uh, you know, he came on on set. According to Reichardt, she told this at the at a, a film society uh, meeting you can find on YouTube. And she tells a story of, uh, you know, they they shot this in 18 days, uh, roughly. She said there were more uh, more shoots she did with a local cinematographer in Portland uh, after the crew had disbanded uh, to get you know more trains going by and things like that. But but the the core shoot was 18 days, and uh, Patton came on. Uh, you know, his first day of shooting and after watching uh you know standing around on set watching he says he comes to her and he says uh, kelly I, I get the feeling that uh pretty much this could be a a, a one take thing right and she said oh yeah tick tock tick tock man uh please please don't save it for take two or three G- give it all you've got in the very first take because uh, we are on the clock and so uh yeah you say maybe two i think it was one day and i think they they got him and he was he was out um, yeah, he's so, only in a couple scenes, but it was great. It was great to see him. He was he looked uh, he looked in place. You know what I mean? Like usually we, we call it stunt casting when they sort of look out of place, and and I felt very much like he was at home uh, in this film. Yeah, I completely agree. He he seemed to live that world. Um, his conversation at the end really just kind of that really highlighted it for me. Just talking about hey, you know, I need the space. Uh, I need your decision. I, there's something about the, just the way that he presented everything that just he really felt wholly authentic in that particular role, which was great. I mean, I, I, I loved seeing him in the film, but particularly because he lived it so well. Walter Dal- Dalton, you've already mentioned as a security guard, is one of your favorite uh, favorite roles in the film. I agree with you. Uh, why does he stand out? 
I think that it's just such a, a fascinating relationship between him and Wendy and kind of watching him develop over the course of the story as he kind of becomes almost like a little guardian angel to her as she's stuck in this particular place. Um, I just, I loved everything about the relationship and always was kind of thrilled when she ended up kind of back in his circle. It was just great stuff. I, You know, Walter Dalton is one of those guys, he just, I mean, he really has made a career out of just playing bit parts in things. I mean, he's been in tons of stuff. What I found interesting, though, is he actually started as a writer in the 70s and 80s on TV shows like Laverne and Shirley and Barney Miller and uh, and was acting back then, too. And the writing, I don't know if it just never took off or he just kind of quit and just stuck with the acting. But yeah, he's, I mean, he's still doing it. He's just been, you know, doing all these bit parts, uh, making a career out of it, which I think is fantastic. He was great. He was definitely sort of the, the you know, heart and soul of the film. And I think it was, uh, um, he, he made a great... Uh, partner for uh, Michelle on screen. Absolutely. Uh, musician Will Oldham is back as Icky. Right. He was in uh, He was in Old Boy with, uh, with Kelly uh, right before this. And he had been in other films like Junebug and Julian Donkey Boy, Madawan. Um, and recently, he, uh, you know, speaking of him being a musician, he's on the soundtrack for Pete's Dragon. He did the Dragon song. Um, so he's an interesting uh, person. And, you know, he pops up briefly in here. And I don't even remember... Uh, specifically who he was, but, uh, you know, he's definitely somebody who's kind of in Kelly's fold, though. And I, I'm assuming Icky was one of the Campfire Kids? I don't think so. No? No, because the credits, uh, let me check the credits now that you say The credits that, do list the Campfire Kids, don't they? They do. And, as, and it's like, as Campfire kid Kids. Kid by fire, something. kid by fire. Yeah. It's relatively in in credit order uh maybe he is one of the people there oh you know what i think he is the guy at the campfire who had worked at the canneries yeah and was yeah you're right and is talking to him so yeah you said kid by the fire and i was like he's too old to be one of the kids but yeah he is the guy i think who was like yeah you know oh don't don't let so-and-so know that uh that i told you to come but tell so-and-so yeah i think that's him um, Michelle says of of her, you know, desire to do this film, or, or you know, or to work with Kelly was uh, largely inspired because she saw him in Old Joy and thought he was transformative. And uh, she said, "I she wanted to do something as as bold and as as uh, um, great as as his performance was." And so I thought that was interesting that it's, uh, uh, you know, he's um, he's an interesting uh, interesting talent. I remember when Old Joy got so much buzz the year it came out, and uh, for some reason I just never ended up checking it out, but I, I need to add it back to my list of things to see, because um, yeah. especially now that I'm kind of getting into this Kelly Reichert series, I feel like I do want to kind of uh, hit that one at some point. John Robinson, uh, Robinson as Andy Mooney. Uh, we already kind of talked about him as the the guy kind of uh, busting her for shoplifting. I don't really have a ton to say about him other than I have enjoyed seeing him quite a bit in films like Elephant and Transformers and Lords of Dogtown. Did you really enjoy him in Transformers? He has a tiny part. It's not very big, yeah. but I enjoyed him. You know, he just kind of, <laughs> he was such a goofy character, you know, hanging from a tree and being all goofy. And I enjoyed him. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so win this round, Nelson. Let's jump straight to cinematography, can we? Sam Levy, a friend of the show. Yeah, let's do it. This this is an interesting point. I almost feel like you made the point earlier that this is not a this is not a big IMAX screen film, and I I agree with that. Uh, mostly because this is like straight up low light, nat light, high ISO filmmaking. Right? It is grainy, and the bigger the screen. The, the more distracting that grain and that low light becomes for me. I, I find it, I, I, you know, I, I actually found it easier to watch on my iPad than I did on my television. Oh, yeah. On my television, the scene when uh, the, the creepy guy uh, kind of confronts her in the forest, um, it was yeah. so dark. I had to rewind it and play it again to go to, just to try to figure out what exactly was happening. What because, happened? Yeah, it was so it was so dark and so hard to see. And I, I finally pieced it all together. And between my wife and I, we were able to kind of go, oh, okay, so she's running now and stuff. But it, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it, clearly it's a film where they were just like, let's make it as naturalistic as possible. And, and they went with it. Um, 
I would say slightly to the detriment of the film because it just makes it so hard to see. Um, outside of that, though, I do think that the cinematography was nice. I liked the way that that uh, Sam kind of framed things. I did find it interesting. I didn't make a note about this, but um, I kept realizing that as they would, as we'd go through scenes, there were a number of times where the camera would stop and linger on graffiti on the wall, almost as if it was kind of a. a um, a, just a, almost like these interesting message boards of people who've passed by. And um, considering her transitive life and this journey that she's on, I just found it really interesting that that was the sort of imagery that we ended up sticking with was the graffiti. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I think about Portland is kind of a cool graffiti town. And I think of it as such kind of a positive thing. You know, there's there it's it's there's great street art and yeah, some of it's dirty and gross, but whatever. Most of it is 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 very cool. And in that regard, some of the imagery that they stick on is it it shows it's more of an underbelly. Some of that is interesting. You know, we didn't talk about this so much. They they filmed it in Portland, but uh, it it is not set in Portland specifically. It's set in kind of an unnamed uh, working class town um, that that is supposed to represent. Uh, again, that certain class of of kind of poverty, the evaporated job poverty, and uh, and so you know maybe that was part of setting the tone of some, of a place that isn't really Portland. It didn't. It, I mean, that's interesting that you say it because it never felt like Portland to me. It felt it felt like a small small town. You know, it felt yeah. like. R- not quite rural, but it, it definitely kind of a small town vibe. Like if yeah. she was in Portland, she was on the very edge fringe of Portland. Like that's yeah. that's that would have been what I would have guessed if if yeah. Portland was brought up at all. You know? Yeah. No. And she, I mean, she wasn't. She was on kind of the the east side, and it, it's kind of original Portland, but it's not not fringes. You know? It was, it's funny because you know the the she's on the bus and she gets off the bus and that's a bus line that we know and that's our little TriMet bus and how exciting is that that it's full and that she's like talking to the the you know to the security guard he's like well this little town's falling apart I'm like hey, that's my town you're talking about jerk <laughs> mister <laughs> uh anyway so i think they did a good job of setting that up anyway back to cinematography yeah when it's dark it's super dark but i love uh, as always i mean we love the the, the way sam uses camera and um and so uh, it was it's a treat to see him working on a film uh like this as sort of gorilla as this uh, yes it's a treat. Definitely. And, and you know, I mean, we've talked about Kelly uh, already as a kind of a director and writer, but you know, she edited this film as well. I mean, talk about a person who's wearing lots of hats, right? Yeah, right. She said she took, uh, you know, as we've already mentioned, they shot the thing in 18 days. She edited it. Her first cut took her six months um, uh, after that. So, uh, y- you can tell we talk about, you know, Michelle is an introspective actor. Uh, Kelly is very clearly an introspective and deliberate, uh, editor, uh, of her own work. And, and I, I think it actually, I, I think it works really well. I mean, in terms of me having trouble with the, the length of the film, that wasn't necessarily the result of, uh, you know, editing choices, right? It, it was the result more of a narrative that I just felt like I could have connected with even better at a shorter scale, right? But that, I'm not talking like five minutes shorter. I'm talking like, give me a 15 minute film. Um, and and that's a different beast uh, for for what it is. I think it's 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 paced well. Uh, did she say at all? Did she ever consider uh, score, or was it always designed to be kind of with sounds? And I mean, the only score we really have is kind of the end credits. Uh, we got a little bit that um, that Will Oldham had actually kind of composed as a theme, and uh, then there's kind of some occasional humming that's thrown in. It almost is as if it's it's windy humming, but it's not done in a way where we think that Wendy's actually humming. It just kind of seems like, uh, you know, somebody is humming near the camera. Well, it's kind of it you know, it, that's actually really funny. It is. I mean, it is windy humming, but only I, I agree with you. I only know that because Michelle tells this story in the same interview uh, about trying to come up with the song. And apparently her greatest challenge uh, in coming up with the song to hum in these sequences. And that was just a character effect. It's not in the script. It's not in the short story. It's just something that she felt like this is, if I'm lost in my, like, if, if I'm sort of in this space 
and I'm, you know, I, I've lost, I don't have anything, right? This is just hours and hours and days and days of solitude. What am I going to do? And she sort of found this affect of humming, but she kept humming copywritten songs. Mm. And her character like kept coming back to songs that she couldn't hum on film. So she actually called Will Oldham and, and, uh, and said, I need a favor. I need you to give me a song that we can use for the film that I can hum. And then on the day of shooting any of her humming stuff, she couldn't remember it. And so the song that she hums is an amalgamation of probably some of that and then uh, mostly just <laughs> random <laughs> random sounds coming from her throat. Uh, and it's a it's a very sweet kind of a kind of a story. But um, yeah, in terms of your score question, no, I, I have no reference for that. Uh, the way she talks about using train sounds for score, it, it sounds really deliberative. Like that's a that that was a, a choice very early on a, right. as she connected it directly to the the title of the ultimate title of the short story, you know, that train choir is ju- just it, it sounds like it really spoke to her, but you know, uh, that would that's a great question. Yeah, well, uh, Leslie Schatz and Eric often were the re-recording mixers, sound designers, and I mean to that end, I actually I I, I mean for for a relatively minimalistic sort of film, I did enjoy kind of the sounds that were in here. And maybe it was just because I was noticing things like the trains and stuff. So and and occasionally like a dog bark or things like that, that kind of, you know, cue you in on certain things. So, you know, it's actually kind of an interesting sound design, one that I was surprised maybe that I noticed more uh, than I would have expected in a minimalist film like this. It it really set the the uh, the uh, acted as as kind of a character setting I think really effectively and I'm I I'm with you it it surprised me just how in touch with the uh, with the elements that 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 soundscape um, uh, allowed me to be yeah absolutely uh, how to do it award season it wasn't like a big Oscar winner or anything although I guess there was some Oscar buzz for uh, Michelle Williams I mean she certainly um, is somebody who has uh, had a few nominations. Um, but uh, not any actual uh, nominations for the Oscars. She did end up getting a nomination for the Independent Spirit Awards, where it also was nominated for Best Film. They both lost. Uh, Best Film won to, went to The Wrestler, and Melissa Leo uh, won for Frozen River. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, AFI did name it the movie of the year. And uh, this did open at Cannes. It premiered at the 2008 Cannes Film Festival. And it's funny, Kelly Reichert uh, was nominated for Un Certain Regard Award, although uh, Sergei Dvortsevoy for uh, Tulpan ended up winning that award. And the funny award is that Lucy, the dog, ended up winning an award called the Palm Dog. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how many other uh, dogs have received that award, but uh, (laughs) congrats, Lucy. (laughs) <laughs> that is yes. so good. So funny. Uh, yeah. So it, this was a film, though, that did end up on a lot of top 10 of the year lists. A lot of people really love this film and connected with it. Um, it's just it is a small film. It's not something that uh, is going to do uh, tremendous box office. And to that end, uh, you know, working off this uh, low, low independent film budget of three hundred thousand uh, dollars for their eighteen day shoot, which was about three hundred thirty six thousand in today's dollars. Kelly's uh, film secured a limited theatrical release that, at its widest, hit 40 screens, so really not a lot. Uh, The movie opened Wednesday, December 10th, 2008, opposite the Kate Winslet, Ray Fiennes drama, The Reader, and then a few days before the giant sci-fi remake, The Day the Earth Stood Still, the animated film Delgo, and everybody's favorite, favorite Christmas comedy, Nothing Like the Holidays. The movie did have enough of a draw to make $865,788 domestically and $550,351 internationally, making a total of $1.4 million about at the box office, or just uh, almost $1.6 million in today's dollars. All told, this means Kelly's movie earned an adjusted profit per finished minute of uh, about fifteen and a half thousand, a relatively impressive amount for this little film. Uh, but you know, I thought this was interesting, Pete. Just to put it into perspective, her film had a profit to cost ratio of four point seven two percent, which means it, it made <laughs> oh, about man. four. It made about four times its budget, which actually puts it just below the Matrix, which had a profit <laughs> to cost ratio of four point seven three percent. <laughs> Yay! That may be the only list that pairs the Matrix and a Kelly Reichardt film. It may, may be the very only list, Andy. And we've oh, got it. We've got it. That's right. 
Brilliant. So good. So good. All right, man. I think it's time for us to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel or just swipe over in your podcast player of choice to the show notes. You can tap on that flick chart link. It'll take you right to Wendy and Lucy in flick chart and you can add it to your list and let's see how it stacks up on ours. All right. First up, our new O Brother block has been pretty consistent. Wendy and Lucy or Mad Max? Definitely Mad Max for me. Yeah, it's Mad Max. Wendy and Lucy or the host? Andy. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to say the host, Pete. <laughs> you weren't expecting that, okay. were you? Oh, I, I, honestly, I kind of was. I kind of was. <laughs> I am also the host on this one. All right. Wendy and Lucy or Say Anything. Oof, boy. No, I'm going to say Say Anything. Yeah, say anything. Wendy and Lucy or Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> I'm definitely Wendy and Lucy. <laughs> uh, I am Wendy and Lucy as well. All right. Phew. Uh, Wendy, <laughs> you get worried sometimes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Wendy and Lucy or Christmas in Connecticut. Nice little Christmas Barbara Stanwyck film. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say Christmas in Connecticut. Yeah, I feel bad because Wendy and Lucy, I actually really found an affecting film. I just, it's not one that I find myself probably returning to that much. Yep. Uh, Wendy and Lucy or Fritz Lang's Manhunt. Ah, uh, Manhunt. I'm almost inclined to say Wendy and Lucy on this one. I think if it was one of know, our other Fritz Langs, I probably would pick it, but. Yeah, but but you, you did say almost. I know. I'm going to go with Manhunt. Yeah. Wendy and Lucy or the Andromeda Strain. I actually am going Wendy and Wendy Lucy. Wendy and Lucy. Yeah. yeah, Wendy and Lucy. Wendy and Lucy or the Danish Girl. Wendy and Lucy. Oh, I'm I'm the Danish Girl. Okay, well I'm let's pretty, do. I'm pretty firmly the Danish Girl. Yeah, let's let's do. Let's it. do a little Rochambeau right, on this here, one. Here we go. All right, one, one two, two, three, three. scissors. scissors. Mm-hmm. Oh. scissors. <laughs> scissors. Oh. <laughs> scissors. <laughs> We're in each other's brains. Paper. Scissors. <laughs> you just gotta have a little faith, Andy. You just gotta I, I, have a little faith, I, and you'll see I, it through. I just, I couldn't do it. You, you broke. Right. You caved. I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that puts Wendy and Lucy at 275 on our flick chart. 275 out of 296. It's a little low for my taste, considering I actually really like the film. But again, because of just my, my sense of uh, rewatchability, I think it's probably okay down there. Yeah, I think so, too. It, it is, as you say, I mean, it's an affecting film. And it, it tells a story that of a, of a part of... Uh, a part of the country, right? I mean, and, and I don't mean geographic, but but cultural piece of the country, the part of the landscape that is important, and um, and and gets little service, and and I appreciate that deeply. Uh, but as a film, I just didn't connect with it quite as as much, uh, honestly, as I'd hoped to. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to next week's film. Uh, what does that do for your letterbox? Uh, I'm at three and a half, three and a half out of five. Okay, let's uh, let's lock it in at a solid three, can we? I was I was coming in at two, but I think a, a two and a half will will do all right. Yeah, I think that's fair. So uh, that's good. That's fair. So wh- wh- t- talk about where we go from here. What do we have to look forward to next week? Uh, well, we are going to be continuing our series, and like I said, or like we you brought up earlier, we're kind of doing this Michelle Williams slash Kelly Reichert thing. Uh, we're going to be taking a, a little jump back into the past, and we're going to be looking at Meek's Cutoff. Meek's Cutoff. Have you seen I, this one? I No, this is, you know, like I said, Wendy and Lucy is my first uh, Kelly Reichert film. Oh, that's right. Um, I'm curious about this one. It, it's a kind of a Pioneer Days, uh, kind of a historical thing. She certainly had a little more money with it and everything. So I am curious to see uh, where they go with it. Me too, very much. Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, it's promising. Can I say that? It's promising. Yes, I think that's fair to say. All right. Well, until then, I got to go to bed. All right. I hear the whistle blowing. I've got a train to catch.
Amazon giveth, Andrew. As Amazon always doeth. Three star. Old DW wrote in August 2nd, 2015, says the mediocre plot line is the subject. This movie is a bit dark and seemed to end prematurely. The film quality was a little grainy and the camera had long spans of little to no movement, which gave the sensation of ominous style as if something was going to jump out and scare the watcher. And then, surprisingly, the movie abruptly ended. If you are after a movie that leaves you with a feel-good sensation, this will not be a good option for you. There's no resolution to the movie's plotline, and in all, it was a bit vanilla. However, I like dogs, and this movie featured one. I guess that makes it mediocre. Wow. I also That's like pasta is. and Oreo cookies. <laughs> <laughs> a stiff gin and tonic and a slap in the face. This is why we love Amazon, right? <laughs> That's right, Amazon. Uh, what do you got? Well, I actually have a five star by Kexi Tucson. That's just the, <laughs> I, probably my favorite name I've come across on, uh, on Amazon is Kexi Te- Tucson. Kexi Kex- Tucson. Yes. Kexi uh. says, I'm going to read the uh, the title last because the title is kind of the part that <laughs> does it the best for me. But here you go. Okay. More and more of us are learning that life is going to be harder and hungrier than we expected. Wendy has a dream of, of Alaska, but when her car dies, she has to make a choice between her dog and her dream. Michelle Williams is a versatile and gifted actress. Kelly Reichert's low-key thoughtful films don't get the attention they deserve. This movie touched my heart and stays with me. Now here's the title. Quite possibly my all-time favorite movie. Parentheses. <laughs> Maybe tied with Repo Man. <laughs> <laughs> that was just I not what I was expecting to see as the tiebreaker there. <laughs> Repo Man, Wendy oh and Lucy. God. Repo Man, oh Wendy and Lucy. <laughs> Michelle Emilio. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Losing a dog. <laughs> Green glowing cars. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> it is hard to believe that we have been having in depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit, some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices, like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? <laughs> our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and whatever happened to baby jane are you calling betty davis big only in personality and force (laughs) she is a force to be reckoned with (laughs) we talked about the entire the godfather trilogy of course iconic page to screen even if it is just the one mario puzo book wonder if coppola will ever make the sicilian we also had some zhang yimu adaptations with judo and raise the red lantern absolutely gorgeous movies And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. (laughs) 